What is one thing you love about your daddy? Uh. <laughs> so what's it like being a kid? Uh, being a kid is fun. You have like no responsibilities because I mean, if parents were allowed to be a kid again, they'd be like, "Wow, this is really easy." What do you love about your daddy? That he plays basketball with me and jumps on a trampoline. What do you do to honor your mom and dad? Um, when they ask me to leave, I guess I just like accept the challenge. Hey, Bettis, what does Mama say? <laughs> what does Daddy say? <laughs> what is one thing that your dad does that drives you crazy? He always puts a limit on our bedtime, like go to bed in three minutes or else. Uh... What is the best thing that your mom and dad have taught you? Oh, Jesus. Hey, Dorothy. What's something mom and dad always tell you to do? <laughs> One thing that mommy taught you. Listen. One thing you love about your daddy. I have no idea. I don't know. Try to think of one thing for crying <laughs> out loud. One thing that you love about your daddy. He jumps me on the trampoline? Great. Well, that was perfect. <laughs> oh, man, we decided to spare the older kids. So if you miss your campus pastor on the screen, his kids got spared because they aged out of that video. This is an all radius Sunday. So it's a Sunday if you're new at radius where we get together like this at all six campuses. And we just enjoy the direction of radius together. And we try to say some things exactly the same way. And this particular Sunday, we're talking about parenting. So we thought we would put a few of our kids on the screen. Something I really wanted to let you know, this is how Radius works. If you're new to a church like Radius, and for us, this is really important. Hey, we hold our campus pastors to a really high standard. We hold our elders, our shepherding elders. We have a, a variety, a group of leaders, and they meet these qualifications in the New Testament, in both 1 Timothy and in Titus. But we don't ask their wives to be uh, pastor's wives. <laughs> the first time Cheryl was ever called a first lady, she didn't know what in the world that was. We really want our wives, those of us that are pastors, we want our wives to be godly, obviously, and, and, and meet the same standard that we expect all of the partners at Radius Church. But we do not put our families up on a pedestal, certainly not our kids. We try to protect the pastor's kids. We do not want to curse them with some kind of label like that. All of us are passionate and we're working hard to raise families just like you are. Um, and so when we're about to open up this can, I'm, I'm about to teach about parenting right out of Ephesians. We don't want to put pressure on those families. Uh, we, we really kind of want to raise the bar for all of us. Paul in Ephesians raised the bar for parents, for all believers. So if you know Jesus, this thing's kind of high because he taught you how to love. I don't know if you remember how the beginning of Ephesians goes, but it says that he redeemed you. He says that he adopted you as a son. He made you a part of his family. And so all of a sudden, our quotient for loving others rises. The wisdom that we're trusted with because we have the spirit inside of us, it raises the bar on how we would parent our kids. So as we read these verses that we'll take up, you know, just the little bit of time we have on Sundays to get through, I hope that they encourage you, and for all of us that know Jesus, I hope it inspires us to fight for this uh, good work we do as parents. Let me pray, and I'm going I'm to read a couple passages to you. Really glad to be on this team with a uh, variety of pastors at all six campuses, Lord. Thank you for them. Thank you for their wives. Thank you for their kids. Thank you for other parts of our team, all different staff members and other pastors on our staff. It's just a joy to get to work together. It's, uh, it's really cool to be a part of this family here at Radius. All the variety of folks that have, have plugged in and partnered here. It's, it's, uh, it's an honor, Lord, to get to lead in this environment. We pray you continue to use us to reach our Radius, love the Mid Midlands, and, and to make your name great, Jesus. As we talk about parenting, Lord, you know there's pain around this issue. Pray that you'd meet each of us right where we are and that you'd be the better teacher over these next few minutes. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a favorite proverb of my father's. It's Proverbs 17, verse 6. There's a book in the Old Testament called Proverbs. It's just this book of wisdom. And here's the proverb. It says, grandchildren are the crowning glory of the aged. Parents are the pride of their children. It's a really uh, pretty cool statement. That's out of the NLT. Uh, Another translation actually says fathers are the pride of their children. But what I want you to catch from it, grandchildren are the crowning glory of the age. Probably in your room where you're sitting right now, a couple grandparents said amen. Because they, they, they believe that there's so much joy that comes out of them because of their grandchildren. And all of us know because some of the pain that's related to this subject, we all know that our parents are the pride of our lives. And, and when they fail us, it, it has this deep pain related to it. When you read that proverb, what I want you to catch is this attitude. It's an attitude of joy that's supposed to be had in the family. It's this, this, this feeling of great potential in the family. So as I sit up here, like I'm a product of Shirley Reeves, right? And my wife, as we, as we raise kids, Cheryl's the product of Marilyn Stewart. And those two ladies fought hard. They fought for their families, and they fought to discipline us and raise us in the Lord. And, and so our children, my children, are the beneficiary of those two ladies' work. And they can literally, like my mom and Cheryl's mom, can look at our children and see some of the work they did being reproduced in our family. And that, that's supposed to create great joy. I want to, by the end of this, I want you to have one big thing in your mind. I want, I want you, whether you're married or not, whether you have kids or not, no, let, I want you to be able to say without a shadow of a doubt that you're willing to fight for the next generation, that you're willing to sacrifice some of your stuff to bless the ones that are going to follow us in this nation right now, that we would prepare them for the future because of our willingness to give ourselves away. In the Roman world, just... The one century before Jesus, so first century B.C., there was a, uh, a leader named Augustus, and they had this massive problem in Rome. Folks didn't want to have kids. They didn't even want to get married. So, so he had to make these laws. He didn't even know Jesus but because Jesus hadn't come yet. He wasn't a follower of Yah- Yahweh. So, but he had to make these laws because they weren't reproducing anymore. So, so people just loved partying, right? So he made these laws against infidelity and against overspending, which is really interesting, living in a nation we live in right now. Because what happened when folks, when life became all about sex and whatever else they could have, they stopped wanting to get married and have children. And so there was going to be no future leaders of Rome if marriage wasn't in existence and children weren't beloved in one form or another. We made laws to enforce it. And we live in an interesting day right now where some of those same things are highlighted and, you know, un- under our very noses, some horrible things happen in our nation. Things like abortion, things that are promoted uh, even from our, our, our government in that way that, that belittle the value of children. So the next thing you know, you wonder, how, how are we going to go forward if we're a nation that's just that selfish? And before you start pointing a finger politically, hey, if we spend all of our resources on ourselves, if we consume everything, then we have no desire to have kids, right? You don't want to have a kid. You don't want to have too many, ki- too many kids because you want to have enough stuff for yourself. This is really interesting time in our nation. So these verses in Ephesians, they, they're going to jump off the page to you, I, I hope, over the next two Sundays and make a lot of sense to you. Let me, let me read to you Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. And interesting how he ties it to the Lord right out the gate. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well with you. And you'll have a long life on the earth. Verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord. So we decided to split this into two Sundays. This Sunday I'm going to cover, and I'm going to speak to it from the parent side. And next week... Uh, your campus pastor will speak to it 
from the children's side. So I guess this week is about parenting and next week is about childrening. I, I think that's the word. I'm not sure about how to be a child, how to follow your parents. And so it should have like two different views on, on the same subject. And as I talk about being a father or a parent, I, I want to just give you my history. I, I come from a family where I stand on other men's sh shoulders. So I probably have a bit of an advantage on some of you, but I, I think you could probably relate to some of the people in my family. So Here's me in the middle, and I, I, my father's name is Larry. And my dad, uh, his father's name, they called him CC, or his name was Carl. Carl came to Christ in his 30s, right? And, and my dad was already a boy, and he began to pass along the things that he learned about Jesus to his son, Larry. And so my dad caught it a little later than I did, but he was able to take the good things that his dad got and pass them on to me. And now I've passed them on to my children and uh, sure enough, we got some grandchildren. So there's like five generations there. But CC, he cut the road, right? He, he's the tip of the spear. And some of y'all in the room right now, as you hear this, he didn't have the same advantages that I did by standing on these other two men's shoulders. So thank you. <laughs> Single moms. Uh, dad's in the room where you're the first believer in your family. Thank you for cutting the road, and it is a road to cut, and you, you don't have, you're, like, you're going to want to borrow everything you can to learn how to do this thing because it's imperative because we're, we're trying to build, build a spiritual dynasty, right? Like not better than everybody else, we, but we want to pass along this good news that was trusted to us, to our children, and to our future grandchildren and their children. And so right now I'm in the middle of the dynasty and it's my job to pass it along to my grandkids and I got some responsibility for their kids eventually that some of this good news that could flow out of me could go generation to generation to generation. But I'm going to be gone soon, right? Like you could tell I'm getting older by the week. So someday I'm going to be gone and my influence on this planet is going to go away. And so I hope to pass that along to my kids. So when we read this passage, dad's parents, in the room uh, has a variety of really interesting words. He says to fathers specifically, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you, by the way you treat them. Evidently, dads, uh, we got a potential to provoke our children to anger. I certainly have done it at times. That, that, that is a warning, but it's not this warning that makes us run the other way and ole responsibility. We're supposed to be the governor on how discipline works in our house. So, like, you can provoke your children to anger by being passive, or you can provoke your children to anger by being harsh. A lot of times in homes in America right now, certainly in Christian homes, we end up kind of going one extreme or the other. We got the, the, the families that are, like, hyper-controlling, the helicopter parents. They're on top of everything. The kid can't hardly, can't hardly move. And then we got the other folks that are just negligent. And the travel ball coach has a lot more influence on their kid than the parent does, right? Like, so there's this, this tension for us as Christian parents. We're not supposed to provoke our children to anger, but it says we are supposed to bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So we've got this responsibility that's been laid on us. Let me give you just a, a few thoughts on these verses, and then I, I hope to be extremely practical because I think that's what Paul's trying to do in this passage. He just introduced that we're supposed to live by the Spirit. Right before this passage, he, he's teaching us how to be husband and wife in the Spirit. And now he's uh, uh, admonishing, us, uh, admonishing us to be parents in the Spirit. He's literally telling fathers not to provoke their children, which would be totally foreign to that world. Fathers did what they wanted to do in ancient times. And he's coaching them on this is what it looks like to be a, a father under the authority of Jesus. Hey, if you want to be a great dad, or a great mom, if you want to be a great parenting couple, the children cannot be the center of your family. It just won't work. They can't come first. They can't be where your mind is at very first. God has to be. He's got to be the first. And they're going to learn very quickly whether they're first or he's first. And then there really can't be seconds. Like if you're married, and I'm excited that you are, and you got kids, then your spouse comes before your kids. Guess what? All my kids have left the house now. My last one just went to college. And guess who's at the house? Cheryl. Like so, so 32 years of marriage, all that investment that we put into one another, and I realize every home doesn't work just like that. Some of y'all are working with the second marriage. And some of y'all are single again, and you're parenting as a single parent. I appreciate it. So your health, right, as an individual or the health of the couple comes before 
the children. They're not the center. Best way to do this is ask yourself a really honest question. You can look over at your spouse right now and do it if you want. When you think about your home, you ask this question, who's in charge? If you don't know the answer, I can send Mrs. Reeves over to your house and take her about 30 minutes and she can tell you who's in charge. Because a lot of y'all, young, younger families, when you walk into your home, it's really clear who's in charge. It's the kids. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you want to meet the standard of these verses, you can't meet it if you allow your kids to run the house. It's a challenging thing. It's a hard thing. But it is a principle that I am uber confident in putting in front of you. Your kids can't run the house if you really want to raise them in a healthy way. So the goal is, according to these verses, it seems is like if we're going to bring them up, there's some nurture in there and there's some love. With discipline and instruction, then evidently we're going to train them up how to be an adult. So we've got this end game in mind where they're not going to be here forever. We're preparing them for a future away from us. So we're training them up on how to be an adult. In this passage, it says that comes from the Lord. So there's this expectation that they're going to be an adult. And we hope that they're also going to be a representative in the kingdom of God and, and carry out kingdom business as they walk the planet as an adult. This is a pretty interesting proverb. It's Proverbs 22. A lot of good proverbs about parenting. It says this. A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it far away. <laughs> That's a great one. A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness. I don't know if you can remember when you were a kid. I can remember when I was a kid, and that is absolutely true. It's always shocking to me when a baby comes in a room and everybody dotes on them. Oh, what a sweet, what a sweet baby. They always say they're beautiful babies. I, I, I never, like, they never really seem that beautiful to me yet when they're born. But, but sweet baby, yes, but I, I learned really quick from my kids, and I know I proved it as a kid that I might have looked sweet, but I had a whole lot of foolishness in me, and I needed it to be trained out of me. And my mother gave full effort at that, and she fought with her time and energy, <laughs> with the tone of her voice, to work some of that foolishness out. Some of y'all uh, right now are getting a little panicky. Don't. Don't get panicky. Let's just let's work through this together. Super important for the future of our world, really, but certainly of the church of Jesus Christ. Some of y'all have this kind of thing inside of you, you're like you wanting to point at your spouse, right? Like, he didn't do this. Most of the time it goes like that. He didn't do this. Or sometimes it'll go, I can't get her to discipline. And we'll point, don't, don't point the finger right now. Let's just take it in and let's figure out how to do this together. I think one of the uh, really important things for us in our years of parenting, 30 years now, is that when we, when we got down, we had to decide to fight for it again. Uh, invariably, Cheryl and I would be going to bed. All the kids would be in bed. We have a bunch of them. If you didn't know, I have six. And I uh, feel like we lost the house. Like the kids were clearly in the center. They were running our home. And the way they were behaving just looked jacked up. And uh, we'd be a little panicky. And over the course of time, we, we, we started learning, hey, we, we've, we've got a little slack. So we'd spend some time praying together, which is difficult, I know, for some of you. But it would be a great thing to do tonight. Review where the kids are. Look at each other. Pray specifically for the kids. And then Cheryl would do this. Cheryl would sit them. Uh, certainly in the early years, Cheryl uh, did the majority of the disciplining. She would sit them on the couch and she'd go, she would say, I haven't been as good a mom as I'd like to be. And she'd reestablish the boundaries, and she would then put them into action. And the first day was really painful in my home. And then over the course of three weeks, and when I was home from work, I would help reinforce those boundaries. And over the course of three weeks, it was amazing what could happen in three weeks that we felt like had completely come apart. We fought for it. And I want to encourage you to do that today. We've had older kids come off of uh, the rails. And I'm going to tell you something. I haven't prayed that well about many things. It's the season, and some of y'all are in it now, and I, I'm not the most empathetic guy, but I empathize with the pain of praying for a child away from the Lord or in danger by their own choosing. 
And so we went to war and we prayed for it and we prayed for it and we tried to get to a point where we could rest and trust the Lord with it. Hey, uh, we're in this together. We want to fight for the future of our children together. So uh, I want to invite you to a couple things. One, on the 13th, if you've got a child that you're, you're just really struggling with, we're going we're gonna to hold an all-radius prayer night. We're going to host it at Radius Lexington. And we're, we're simply at 6.30 going to gather, and we're going to pray for our kids. We're going to pray together. We're going to do it together. We're going to war on one another's behalf. You can be a grandparent. You could be uncle or aunt. or You could be whoever you want. You want to come in and pray for somebody by name. That's what we're going to do because we believe that God chases after his children. And then Cheryl and I are going to do a little Q&A. We don't know at all. As a matter of fact, we've proven a lot of things not to do over the years of parenting. We're going to do a little Q&A in, in, uh, on a podcast. So you want to send in questions, those will be available for you to be able to send in the question, and, and we'll give you what we got. So the most moving pictures in the last few days from the uh, invasion of Ukraine has been uh, the fathers getting their wife and children to the border and staying and fighting moves me every time I hear one of those stories. And you can see the kids gripping some because they don't know if they're gonna, ever going to see their father again. The father's being brave, and I'm assuming radius guys, like this is what we would do, right? We would stand up for this place, and we would defend our land, and we would put our life on the line. But I can't help but think, did they prepare their family for this moment? Like it's great that they're willing to die for the land that they live on, but did they pass along to their kids? Everything that they wanted to, because we never know when that time's going to come. My favorite scene in The Patriot, old school movie, I think made about 2000. Mel Gibson, I don't even remember, I think his name was Benjamin Martin in the movie. Combination of a variety of, of war heroes. There's this scene where one of his sons is killed, and uh, it's, it's horrific. My heart sinks, I, I'll, I'll cry at this point every time, and then there's, the next scene is he's grabbing his gun, and he's got his three younger sons, and they're all grabbing their guns, and they've been trained, and they're running to fight the enemy as a family. And the ongoing next five minutes are emotional and painful, something you never want your kid to have to grow up before he has to, but you want him to be ready. You want him to be ready to be a man or a woman if the situation demands it. And certainly in Ukraine, those children, there's a demand for them to grow up really fast right now. So parents in the room, our work is urgent. It is uh, incredibly important for the future of the church in the United States and for our, just our simple individual children's hope and future. So I got a friend at Grace Church in uh, in Greenville, he's a great friend of mine, and they do this a really great job talking about parenting. They got a series. If you want to go to their website, GraceChurchSC.org, a series called Parenting Matters. It's four parts. They spend about forty five minutes a piece. If you, if you can't figure this parenting thing out, listen to all four parts. I'll, I hope to just inspire you to take a next step today, because that's all the time I've got. They do a really good job of talking about how you parent when the children are young, like zero to five, and then what you do when they're six to 11. It doesn't work out exactly like on their 12th birthday, you make a transition, and then what you do from 12 to 18 and how this thing kind of works. Our world and what we're being taught in society is the exact opposite of what the Proverbs would teach or the Bible would teach. And quite honestly, it's what the world is teaching is the exact opposite of what works. So they, they run you through this little graph. It's pretty cool. Um, the first part of a child's life, you're establishing authority. We got a bunch of young families in, in the room. I want to give you a permission today. I want you to walk out the door saying, this is my house, and establish authority in your home. And then there's this second process, 6 to 12, 13, whatever, of developing responsibility. And this third process of facilitating independence. Pretty different, right? Like at the beginning, establishing authority, you're telling them, hey, I make the decisions here. At, at our house, we go to Wendy's, a bunch of kids in a minivan, pull up to the uh, a little drive through and the lady says, what do you want? And I look back in the back and it's, it's like this, do you want a hamburger or a chicken burger? 
we're going to make it that simple. <laughs> and, and they had to choose, and they got to choose fast. If they don't choose fast, I go chicken burger. I'm going to choose for you. I'm establishing authority. You're like, that's not fair, man. They could get like one of the mochas with like, I don't know what y'all have in your mochas. Like, like, it's not about fair. I'm trying to raise my kids for their futures. I'm trying to bless them. I'm trying to give them this sense of authority so that when they have a ball someday, they'll know what to do. So the coaches love having them on their team so that the teacher never has to call me. Chicken burger or hamburger? It's also really easy as a parent to make a decision in the drive through line. And then uh, they move to this second stage of developing responsibility. And that second stage is interesting, so I send them into Wendy's with a $5 bill. I know I'm cheap. You go to 99-cent meal, you can get a lot of food for that. Malachi Reeves used to get three uh, chicken sandwiches because he could give them all 99 cents, a fry and a shake and a water to maximize his total intake, right? So I'm teaching him some responsibility. You got $5? If, if, when it's gone, it's gone. You can take some home. You do what you want to, and he's going to maximize his food intake there. You kind of walk in with him in it. I don't know when the kids are little and you're saying chicken burger or hamburger. You kind of got the, your hands on their shoulders and you're guiding them. You're going like this. And then when you give them the $5, you're kind of putting your hand on their shoulder and you're walking in with them. And you're, you're helping them to make the decision. And then as they get older, you're beginning to, you're trying to facilitate independence to teach them how to do this. College, choosing a college was a really interesting part where we're facilitating independence. So uh, JT, some of you guys know JT. He's 21. He's deciding where to go to college. He's really smart. Got that from his mama. So uh, he puts in an application to Princeton, and we go up and visit Princeton. I don't know what I think about Princeton, right, because it's pretty liberal, and I'm not talking about politically liberal. I'm talking about the way they treat the Bible specifically, and I don't even really know what I think, but I'm leading like this. So I'm facilitating independence. We get up there, and we go through the tour, which, you know, like it was clear in the course of the tour that I'm the least educated person in the whole group. And JT's taking it all in. We're seeing each spot. And they tell us about one president. I think James Madison went to Princeton. And they show us a room where he was. And then he'd take us out to this gazebo. And the guy's going on. And got all these parents and kids in a circle. And he's like, does anybody else, anybody in here know who the other president is that went to Princeton? It was hilarious. Like all, all, all these brains are, are just churning. You can almost see like the smoke coming out of their ears. And I'm looking around watching the parents trying to remember who else went to Princeton and the kids working about it. I looked at JT because I wanted kind of permission to answer because you're right. I knew the answer. Right? So I, I go, Woodrow Wilson. JT looked at me. I'm like, what? We walk out. He goes, how did you know? I go, it was on the side when we walked in this place. It was awesome. It was this moment. And I hope you feel it right now of joy for me, like the least educated view of my son in this place. I don't belong, but he does. And help him make a decision on that college and to pray for where he should go. It was, uh, it was a joy and it was a blessing to get him where he's at now and watch him grow in the Lord. Hey, this passage... Uh, puts a ton of weight on discipline and instruction. It says not to provoke our children, but to discipline and instruct them in the Lord. So just for a few minutes, I don't have a lot of time. I want to help you with discipline. Kind of the Reeves MO. We like to talk about it, discipline. Cheryl tells me every time I talk about discipline, I need to remind everybody how many hugs we gave, how much affection went with that. So I'm going to take a few minutes on discipline. I'm going to be really practical, and I'm borrowing this from my friend in Greenville. Um, then I want to take a minute or two on instruction. Hey, when you have young kids and we have a lot of families there, you, you, you really want to start here with the hands on the shoulder. You want to define reality for them. So chicken burger or hamburger, right? You're defining reality. You're, you're going to tell them what you believe. You can't force your kid to believe everything, but you're going to tell them what you believe. You're going to define good and bad. Kind of awkward at times, good and bad. Hey, we don't say that, right? You're going to say something, hey, we don't say that. And, and we're not going to have a Ph.D. conversation on why we don't say that word. We're just going to tell them, we don't, we don't say that. And then you demand that they don't say that. You're going to put mashed potatoes in, in front of them, and they're going to go, I don't, I don't like mashed potatoes. You're going to go, eat your mashed potatoes. And you're like, man, what kind of parent were you? Yeah, I was that kind of parent. I'm trying to bless my kids by starting here so that when they get older, I can free them. Some of y'all, as you know, and you, you, you're saying amen right now because you started 
is how our society teaches us to raise our kids, with them full of freedom, they're supposed to discover themselves from zero to five, and then when you try to rein that back in when they're 15 or 16, you're squeezing them back in, and it's, it's virtually impossible to get it back. So we start in here tight, eat your mashed potatoes, so that later when they're older, they got this freedom, and they can make a good decision because you established character in them when they're young, and they know what to do with authority. So first you define reality. It's uh, not that complicated. Eat the food on your plate. <laughs> uh, tell them straightforward what they can and can't say, what they can and can't touch. You're just coaching them, and it seems like it's endless. Some of you parents with young children, you know it's just this endless grind of work as you educate them and you teach them what reality is. Number two, you want to train them toward productivity which is, is to say you're proactive in training as opposed to reactive.